So shalom everyone, my name is Rabbi Patrick Olaf, and I am the uh, Executive Director of Punk Torah, which is the organization under which One Shul exists. We are a non-profit online Jewish community with live streaming Shabbat services, classes, and holiday events. We're a very special kind of community because we serve everybody. We have no membership dues. We have no membership fees. We don't have fees to take any of the classes because we want to serve as many people as possible. What does that mean? By just showing up, you are a member. And here's the best part. If you are a member, that means you are also a leader. So we're always looking for leaders, which is you, to help in two ways. We always need volunteer support. We need people to teach we need people to lead services, to facilitate discussions. We need people to sit in the chat rooms and to act as moderators. Uh, we need people to help with technical work, things like uploading videos, graphic design, all kinds of things like that. So it's not all teaching and academics and ritual and things like that. There's lots of different things you can get involved in. You can get involved in writing. You can even get involved in uh, checking spelling. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can get involved. Whatever your talents are, whatever your interests are, there is a place for you in this community. So I would really encourage you to send me an email, patrick at punctora.org, and let's work together to build a beautiful Jewish community. Now, because we don't have high holidays tickets, because we don't have membership dues, um, because we don't p charge people to study Judaism, we do require financial support. It does cost money to run a website. It costs money to host the website. It costs money for the streaming, the, uh, the video technology. It costs a fee every month. Uh, the chat room costs a fee every month. And keeping it all together, making sure everything's working, that costs money every month. So we need to have your financial support as well. You can do that by clicking the Donate with PayPal button uh, up at the top. You don't have to have PayPal in order to use that. You can donate with a credit card, debit card. And again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, just send me an email, pa <clears throat> patrick at punctora.org. So I am thrilled today to have the opportunity to actually talk about one of my favorite pe stories, favorite pieces of the Torah, which is the Akedah, which is the binding of Isaac. People call it the sacrifice of Isaac. It's truly, if you want to be literal, it's the binding of Isaac. So because we're an online community, we're able to really borrow and remix and do lots of great things with all of the technology that's available online. So what we're going to do for our Torah study is not only are we going to study Torah, but we're actually going to attend a Torah reading. We'll begin uh, with a blessing to kind of bring us into the spirit of Torah study. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kishanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. That blessing is the blessing that you say before you study Torah. Now, as I mentioned last night, the blessing itself is actually not for the studying of Torah. When I think of studying, I think of memorizing something. I think of learning something that you're going to be tested on later. La'asok basically means to engage with. And I think that that's a more powerful way of approaching Judaism. We are not being tested on what we know. We're being, we're being tested in how we engage with something. That's different. I think that's a beautiful way to kind of kick off what we're doing here. So we're going to start by listening to this uh, portion of text being chanted. We have the text available here in the chat room if you'd like to listen and try to read along. Now, of course, not everybody knows Hebrew. Nobody, not everybody, you know, can look at the text in Hebrew and, and follow along with it. It is included. But perhaps there are some words that you know. And I'll go through real quick here a few words that I know you will know in Hebrew. Avraham, Abraham. You'll hear that word. Yitzhak, Isaac. Moriah, Mount Moriah. 
Adonai, God. That's another word you'll hear that you'll know. Hineni, here I am. That's another word that you'll hear. When you hear these words, try to absorb them as much as you can. See what kind of pops out of the text as you're listening to it. And in this way, we can sort of cleave to Torah, even if Hebrew and struggling with Hebrew is sort of not where we're at um, at this particular moment. So with that, I bring you the Torah reading for second day Rosh Hashanah.
ויאמר אברהם אלוהים עיר אלוהסה לעולה בני וילכו שניהם יחדיו ויבוא אל המקום אשר אמר לו האלוהים ויבן שם אברהם את המזבח ויערוך את העצים ויעקוד את יצחק בנו ויעשה מותו על המזבח ממעל לעצים וישלח אברהם את ידו ויקח את המחלת לשחוט את בנו ויקרא אליו מלאך אדוני מן השמיים ויאמר אברהם אברהם ויאמר הנני ויאמר אל תשלח ידך אל הנער ואל תעש לו מאומה כי אתה ידעתי כי ירא אלוהים אתה ולא חסכת את בנך את יחידך ממני ויישא אברהם את עיניו ויעל והנה העיל אחר נאחז בסבך בקרניו וילך אברהם ויקח את העיל ויעלהו לעולה תחת בנו ויקרא אברהם שם המקום ההוא אדוני יראה אשר יאמר היום בהר אדוני ויקרא מלאך אדוני אל אברהם שנית מן השמיים ויאמר בי נשבעתי נאום אדוני כי אשר עשית את הדבר הזה ולא חסכת את בנך את יחידך כי ברך אברכך והרבה 
הרבה זרחה ככוכבי השמיים וככל אשר על שפת הים וירש זרחה את שער אויביו ויתברכו וזרחה כל גויי הארץ עקב אשר שמעת בקולי וישוב אברהם אל נעריו ויקומו וילכו יחדיו אל באר שבא וישב אברהם מבאר שבא ויהי אחרי הדברים האלה ויוגד לאברהם לאמור הנה ילדה מלקה גם היא בנים לנחור אחיך את עוץ בכורו ואת בוז אחיו ואת כמואל אבי ארם ואת כסד ואת חזו ואת פלדש ואת ילף ואת בתואל ובתואל ילד את רבקה שמונה אלה ילדה מלכה לנחור אחי אברהם ופילה גשו ושמע ראומה ותלד גם היא את טבח ואת גחם ואת תחש ואת מחש So it's absolutely wonderful that we have the opportunity to engage with, engage with text in so many exciting ways, and one of which is to be able to uh, hear this reading from wherever you are all over the world, which is fantastic. And I love seeing all these different places that everyone is from. It's just absolutely exciting to me. All right, so I want to ask a question of everyone in the room. who has heard of the story of the binding of Isaac or the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, whatever term you want to use, what is a justification for this event? And by that I mean, one example that I've heard is that this is God testing Abraham. Okay? And that's the most commonly understood idea behind this particular piece of text that, you know, God's not really asking him to sacrifice his son, that this is all just a great big test. And that's one way that we get out of the sort of thorniness, the difficulty of the fact that this text is about child sacrifice. Um, and so I would love to know from people in the room, what are some other sort of, for lack of a better word, justifications that you have heard? And so uh, Arava says, this is to teach Abraham that human sacrifice is abhorrent. Uh, Rebecca says that God is proving to Abraham that he's willing to do anything for him. 
Uh, it's a test for Isaac, Yitzhak. Uh, but it's also teaching the world that human sacrifice is not permitted. Okay? So again, we're getting to the idea of it's a test. We're getting into some ideas that it's uh, about showing that child sacrifice, human sacrifice is wrong. Um, it's an interesting way of showing that human sacrifice is wrong, <laughs> since it's uh, condoning human sacrifices and saying, not so fast. <laughs> but who knows, right? Any other ideas that anyone has about sort of how we can work around this text, how we can make it sort of not as harsh sounding? So Tracy says it's a test, and depending on who you ask, Abraham either passed uh, because he showed his loyalty or failed because he didn't question God, um, uh, as we're actually encouraged to do. And Rachel Esther makes the comment that actions speak louder than words. Okay, fantastic. And Eilat uh, 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 says, poor Sarah died from it. Avraham maybe failed in his relationship to her. That's a great point, because Chaye Sarah, the next Torah portion, comes after that and starts with Sarah, uh, Sarah died. Okay, so we have, it's, it seems like a, a few different ways that people have kind of worked around it. Now, the Akedah is always read on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Yesterday, we read about God remembering Sarah. So this is about the birth of Yitzhak, and that was the previous chapter. So then this chapter we read today about the binding of Isaac, and it's an interesting back and forth. The rabbis, when they chose early on what texts should correspond to what days uh, in the Jewish calendar, for lack of a better word, in the liturgical calendar, um, chose this back and forth because it really deals with two different principles during our Jewish New Year. The first is us wanting God to remember us, right? We want to be remembered, for lack of a better word, in this New Year. We want blessings. We want... Um, all of the good things that we hoped for to come to fruition in this uh, next year. All of the things that we didn't get last year, we want to get this year. So we have that side, and that's what we read. Yes, what we read yesterday. Today we read something different, which is a commandment on our end, something that we have to do. So whereas Sarah looked to God in the previous chapter for the blessings that had been promised. In the, re the reverse happens in this reading, which is that we are fulfilling whatever God wants us, wants from us. Okay, So we see this duality here of God doing for us and us doing for God. It's interesting that the rabbis chose the first uh, chapter, the remembering of Sarah first, before the Akedah. The fact that God remembering God's promises comes before us living up to God's standard, uh, which I think is very interesting. And so um, there's lots of different ways that people try to work around it. I'm going to give you my personal opinion. As someone who has read both in Hebrew and in, in various English translations, uh, Akedah, what my thoughts are. These are neither right nor wrong. They are simply my thoughts. I cannot condone a religious tradition that teaches that killing a child or attempting to kill a child is a good way to learn morals. I simply cannot. I have tried. I have tried all of the mental gymnastics to make it work. I've tried thinking of it as allegorical. I've tried thinking of it as, well, this is God showing that human sacrifice is wrong. All of these other things. I've tried to think of it as a test. I've tried to think of all of these different things, and I can't do it. Um, I just can't do it. Here's what we know about child sacrifice. We know that it wasn't extremely common, but it did exist in the ancient Near East. And there's several different references to it in the Bible. Um, the Bible would lead you to think that the pagans, the idolaters, were out just sacrificing their children left and right uh, to uh, Moloch, which is really Molech, uh, which relates to the word Melech, which means king. Um, 
That's what the Bible would have you believe, right? We don't find any archaeological evidence of that. We don't really find it in any of the uh, cuneiform writings that we have um, that are even remotely close geographically to, um, to the Hebrews of the time. It did exist. I'm not disputing that. But it didn't ex exist as this rampant activity. We would have a little bit more evidence. Now, maybe evidence will come to light and I will be uh, eating crow for saying that. But for right now, we know that that's not the case. We do know, however, that it is part of our Jewish history, which is something that's very uncomfortable for a lot of people. And there are stories uh, about this. We see it in Micha uh, or Micah, the book of Micah, talking about, uh, shall I give the firstborn for my sin, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? We hear about the king of Moab sacrificing his son. We hear about... Uh, Gehinnom, the Garden of Hinnom, where child sacrifice is said to have taken place. There's uh, Tophet, which is another place where child sacrifice was said to have happened. Now, on the flip side of the coin, we also have the banning of child sacrifice. It's banned four times in the Bible, twice in Leviticus and twice in Deuteronomy. And it's usually don't sacrifice your children to Molech. Um, now, scholars basically say you don't ban something unless it exists, right? You don't make a law against something that you've never seen before, right? So, uh, to make it very simple to understand, if we did not have cars, we wouldn't have laws against speeding, right? Um, if we did not have, let's see... If we did not have portable electronics, we wouldn't have laws about turning off portable electronics or rules about turning off portable electronics when you're on an airplane, right? It doesn't make sense to have a law for which that experience does not exist. So we do know that it did exist in some way, but I think it was as much a part of our history as it was the history of all of the other peoples that we encountered in the ancient Near East. Now, it's a moot point either way, because I still don't condone harming children. And I have problems with all of the other times in the Bible where we encounter this. I have a problem with the killing of the Egyptian firstborn. I have a problem with the slaughtering of the Amalekites and the Canaanites, the Amorites, or for anyone else. Now, here's something that's really puzzling and really tricky. There is a Bible sc uh, scholar named Richard Elliot Friedman, and he does something very interesting with the text. And I want you to try to look at the text. If anyone here has some kind of Hebrew background, if you have some Hebrew reading skills, this will be a little bit easier for you. Um, but the English you can go along with. So I want you to look at that text that we put up in the chat room, and Audi, if you can put that in the chat room for me, I'd appreciate it. Um, because Dr. Uh, Professor Friedman makes an amazing argument about this text. We're going to do a little bit of midrash, for lack of a better word. Midrash is Jewish legend writing, um, but we're not actually going to write something new. We're going to take something out and we're going to see how it flows. So we go through the text, and we get to about verse 3. Okay. And Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his ass and took, and then this is important, two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. Now I'm looking at the Hebrew, and it does say, et shnei narav, and it also says, et yitzak beno. So it's talking about his young men. Now these, it says literally, not our young men. Uh, not our. Was it servants? You know, it probably wasn't slaves, because you would have used a word like eved. But nonetheless, it's his young men, 
And then it makes a point of saying, and Isaac his son. So, the person who wrote this text is saying that there is a group of people called young men, and there's Isaac. So it's not one grouping of people called young men, or the kids, or the boys, or whatever the case is. It's Avraham's young men, Na'arav, and then Yitzhak, his son, Isaac. And these are two separate things. Three people put into two categories. All right. So he goes up to offer a burnt offering. Isaac speaks to him and says, Father, um, we have everything to build the Mizbeach, which is the altar, um, but we don't have a lamb. And Abraham says, well, God's going to provide us a lamb, so no problem. So then we go through this, the actual ceremony. The wood is on the altar. Isaac is bound, and he's upon the wood. And Abraham stretches forth his hand, and it says, and took the knife to slay his son. Pause. Okay. The shechet, shechot et beno, to sacrifice, to slaughter, to cut his son. Okay? Now, let's stop there. We're not going to read any further. I want you to then go down to verse 19. And verse 19, a, a bunch of stuff has happened, right? But we were left at the climax of the knife about to hit the throat. Isaac is bound. We're, we're pausing in that tough moment, okay? And then let's give ourselves a little amnesia. Let's, let's just kind of forget that anything else is going on. And now we're at the conclusion of the text. And the conclusion of the text says, So Abraham returned unto his... Na'arav, his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Avraham dwelt in Beersheba. Okay, is something missing from the text? Does it appear like something's missing? We, we, we kind of cut, cut out, uh, I guess, about seven or eight verses, um, but jumping from verse um, 11, or... Let's see, verse, excuse me, verse 10. Avraham has got his knife. Yitzhak is on the Mizbeach. He's on the altar. He's about to get slaughtered. We pause. Something happens. And now Avraham is returning with his young men. Is there something that's a little bit strange? A little thing called his son. Right, because... What does the Bible, what does the Torah do? The Torah puts two categories of people, right? Na'arav, the young men. The et yitzak, his son. Okay, two different groups, right? He's got his young people, his workers. Maybe they're people who are help gathering wood. Maybe they're sort of bodyguard type people. Um, laborers of some kind, we don't really know. Et narav, the young men. And yitzak this other sort of person. But when he returns, when he goes back, Yitzhak is missing. Isaac is missing. Now, it's an interesting question. What happened? If you take out the oops, never mind, I'm going to give you a lamb to slaughter, right? Um, and you instead just kind of skip over, or a ram, I said lamb, I meant ram. Um, you, if you skip over that, and you just say, if you take it for granted, if you take it for granted, okay, the ram is caught in the thicket or in the bush, depending on how you want to translate it. So we grab that, and it says that is the burnt offering instead of the sun. Wouldn't you then have kind of a happy ending of some kind, where Isaac is like, Whew, that was a close one, right? And you would have the father and son and these two uh, um, Na'arav, Na'arot, um, walking together. Wouldn't they all be walking down the hill? But Isaac is missing. So here's the argument that one particular Bible scholar makes. He says that this text is actually a very early text 
that condoned child sacrifice. And that the text would have originally read, and maybe not the text, but the story would have originally read, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And then in verse 16, it then says, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, because thou hast done this thing, and hast not... Um, and has not withheld thy son, thy only son, that you will multiply my seed. And Abraham returns to his young men. So it could very well be that what we're doing, if we skip a little bit and we go from verse 10, Isaac, it's implied that Isaac is sacrificed. And then in verse 14, so if we skip over only those three verses, Isaac is sacrificed. Abraham has called the place Adonai Yireh, um, as it is said to this day, in the mount where the Lord is seen. The angel of the Lord calls out uh, to Abraham and blesses Abraham, and then the young men, minus Isaac, go walking. And that's really kind of interesting. And Rachel brings out a really great point as well, which I had never really thought about. Yitzhak, Isaac, is not mentioned in Sarah's burial. Um, you know, and we, we read later on when we get into the relationship of um, Rebecca and Isaac that one of the reasons why Rebecca was so terrific is that uh, Rebecca basically comforted uh, Isaac. You know, Isaac is not seen in the sort of play. Uh, when we get into chapter 23, uh, Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah. So, the argument is made that the original story was that Abraham did sacrifice Isaac, and that later generations of Abraham's descendants did not come through Isaac. Um, but that what happened was that at a certain point, uh, child sacrifice, probably because of the influence of prophets, because the prophets um, that we read in the Book of Prophets and the Nevi'im um, were thought that child sacrifice was so repugnant that they actually altered that story. Now, I'm not saying that the Akedah in that style was ever canonized, right? We have to remember that the Bible developed over time, right? The idea of a single holy text which came from God on Mount Sinai is a later development. Instead, you have an oral tradition. You have stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They come geographically in different regions of the north and the south, Israel and Judah. Um, and they were sort of collected together. Um, there's actually an argument that the stories of the Levites and of... The Passover story actually is another thing that was added in. It was actually added in by the Levites, that the original Hebrew slaves in Egypt may have not been all Hebrews, but just the Levites. That's another um, biblical scholar idea that's kind of being waxed around right now, and we'll see you know, how the evidence kind of comes up for that. It could be that the Akedah started off as a pro-infanticide story, but was later altered by the Hebrews. So let's sit for that, sit with that for a minute, and think about the implications of that. That it was the prophets who took what could have been a folk tale of some kind and altered it to become a different kind of story. And how we would how do we handle that? How does that feel for us? Because it's not the only story that could be like that. There's a couple of other examples. People often ask me, well, don't you believe that the Bible is true? Right? And I say, yes, I believe the Bible is true. Okay? Well, then how can you say that this event didn't happen, or that this event probably is uncertain, or you don't believe that this particular individual in the Bible ever historically existed? Doesn't that mean it's not true? And I go, you're wrong. It's still true. Even if it's not fact, it's true, because there are facts that underline it. 
and the truths of it illuminate the facts. Okay, now that sounds a little screwy. It sounds like strange logic, but I'll give you an example. Of all of the things that you could argue happened historically that are mythology, that are stories in the Bible, what would you pick? Like, what story would you say is most probable to have happened? I'll give you some examples. Um, the conquest of Canaan by Joshua. So that's something that uh, archaeologists are trying to prove, or at least are trying to learn more about. So that's something that you could say, well, that could be historically true. There are plenty of people who... There are plenty of people who believe that uh, the Exodus literally happened, right? Now, maybe there are some differentiations between, you know, what is miracle and what is, you know, what is uh, historical, things like that. So that's another sort of option. You could debate... Um, you know, whether or not certain types of military battles outside of the conquest of Canaan happens. There's a lot of different things historically that you can try to prove or disprove. Um, the United Kingdom under David is another one that you could try to prove or disprove. Um, the one that you probably don't think to immediately jump to is the worldwide flood in Noah's Ark, right? That's probably the one I would say that unless you're a fundamentalist Christian, you probably aren't going to jump on that one as like the golden ticket of if I can prove that, then I can prove everything, right? That's the kind of story that you don't you don't necessarily try to look for. Uh, Rachel makes a great point. The Babylonian exile happened historically, right? So, I mean, there are all kinds of things that we have historical evidence of, but Noah's flood is probably not it. Like, it's probably not the one that you're going to have as your go-to text that you're going to use to definitely think of. So, I want to tell you, though, that I do, in fact, believe that the flood that is described in uh, the Noah, Parsha Noah, in the Noah story, um, actually did take place. I believe it was a historical event. And a few people have actually already kind of uh, jumped on me about it uh, and already uh, already put up the answer, um, which is that there are lots of stories of ancient floods. And, you know, one of them is the uh, epics of Shurupak and Ziasudra, right? Um, so we know from looking at the strata, looking at the layers of rocks, in modern-day Iraq, we can find a layer that's basically a floodplain, a flood layer. And we have lots of stories that come from that region about a, wor a worldwide or a large or a great flood um, that killed lots of people. Usually the story involves a king of some kind who loads up a barge full of animals, and is uh, saved or is spared, and then offers a sacrifice at the end. And we have geological evidence to back that up. We know that during that time, in that place, there was a massive flood and killed lots of people. And we know that there are stories that are written about that. Now, there is an older Babylonian story about this worldwide flood, and it mirrors in a lot of ways, not in every way, but in a lot of ways it mirrors the Noah story. So it could be, it could very well be that we had a sense of this flood, that this was a popular story that had been told, um, uh, that had been told through countless generations, the Babylonians had it, that the scribes knew this story and that they put a monotheistic spin on it. So that's an example, I think, of how you can look at historicity and you can look at the Bible and you can and you can come up with a lot of different kinds of answers. And sometimes it works beautifully. I think the Noah story works beautifully. We have geological evidence, we have contemporary stories to that time, um, so on and so forth.
why I like the fact that we have that Noah story, which is connected to older stories and is connected to uh, connected to geological evidence, may or may not have been original to us, may have been original to someone else. Um, Nonetheless, you have to remember at this time that there aren't the storytelling boundaries that we have now, right? There's no, um, everything is essentially creative commons back then. You don't have uh, copyright Shurupak. You don't have copyright Amorites, copyright Hebrews. People borrowed and shared stories, and that was perfectly fine. It was perfectly acceptable. But here's what I think is interesting. Just like with the Noah story... And just like with Akedah, Judaism sanctifies things. It sanctifies everything. And it doesn't do it by waving a, a magic wand. And it doesn't have to do with uh, making special incantations. It doesn't have to do with somehow trying to justify things. But it's a process that's more like a remix. So this is a metaphor I like to use a lot about Jewish text, specifically the Tanakh. How many of you have an iTunes playlist? So I have, I think, four or five iTunes playlists. I'd be curious to know how many of you on your iTunes playlist have one album by one artist, and that's it. In your playlist, is it just one album with one artist in one doing one genre of music? Most of the time, when people have an iTunes playlist, you have a mix, right? So I think of an iTunes playlist that I have. I have one. I had this, this great theory that uh, one day I was going to become like this big gym rat and I was going to start working out all the time. So, I, of course, I did the laziest thing possible, which is I made the workout iTunes playlist before I ever actually thought about going into the gym, right? And so my iTunes playlist had a little bit of indie rock. It had some metal. It had uh, dance music because I wanted to have something for cardio. It had a lot of heavy songs, stuff with really strong beats because I wanted to have a really strong tempo. But it wasn't one artist doing one genre of music on one album. It was a mix. But it served its purpose, which was to get my energy up, in theory, because I never ended up actually joining a gym. But that's neither here nor there. The idea was that it was to bring out something in me, right? It was supposed to motivate me. It was even, I even called it my morning motivator. Right? That's what it was supposed to do. It served a purpose. And in that way, I was able to put you know, a little bit of punk rock and a little bit of um, electronic and dubstep and whatever and mix it all together into one playlist because it served a purpose that was beyond just listening to one artist's music. It wasn't even really about the music. The music wasn't the point. It was the energy that the music created. It was the motivation that the music created. It wasn't the music itself. The Bible, the Tanakh, Hebrew Bible, is like a playlist. But it goes even further. It's not just a playlist. It's a playlist full of remixes. Akedah, Noah, the creation story, are remixes. They are mixes of a little bit of us, a little bit of other folks, a little bit of history, a little bit of metaphor, a little bit of poetry, a little bit of allegory, a little bit of religion, a little bit of law, blended together. When you read the Bible, you are reading remixes of mixes of playlists. Different types of playlists move us towards different emotions and different actions. So I think of when I was in my early 20s. And it wasn't that long ago, but 
I think about one of the things that I did to try to impress girls. I would make a mixtape, right? And on your mixtape, you put, you know, all these songs that you like and you spend uh, hours trying to think about, you know, what songs am I going to put on there? What are they going to like? What songs are going to flow well together? You're sort of a, a DJ frozen in time when you make a uh, mixtape. And, uh, but here's one of the things about making a mixtape is that you always put secret codes in that. You know, you put little secret, like, you put certain kind of songs in those mixtapes because you want them to hear that you put that song in there and that that kind of reflects on you, right? Mixtapes, mix CDs. You always put, it's it's subversive. It's very subversive when you're trying to, uh, uh, <laughs> when you're trying to woo someone or you're trying to attract the attention of someone that uh, is a potential, um, a potential uh, romantic partner, right? You always put in like that one little love song, right? It doesn't matter it m matter if it's all you know like hair metal, right? You always find that one hair metal song that kind of says like, "Hey, I kind of like you," right? And you uh, you know, and you stick that in there, and you kind of hope that the person who's listening to that mixtape will catch that and be like, "Oh." Wow, right? Yeah, that's they're they're trying to do something there. So, you know, that's that's the kind of stuff you do when you have a mixtape or a playlist or whatever the case is or a series of remixes. You're trying to get people to go aha and to catch on to something. You know? Think about when you've been sad and you play music that's part of your sadness. You know, just throwing it out there, 70s, 80s goth music. Uh, Post-punk, right? Depressing Depeche Mode and uh, stuff like that, right? You listen to that music because it mirrors the experience that you're having, right? You can be Jewish and listen to the song Personal Jesus by Depeche Mode when you're depressed, and it doesn't become a theological problem. The song's about Elvis anyway, but it, that doesn't matter, right? You're listening to it because it brings out something in you. It brings out something emotional in you. It moves beyond the words. It moves beyond the melody. And that's what the Bible does. It's a playlist. It's remixes that bring out something in us. It's a dance. It moves us. And what I think is really important is not to think so much about the music, the words, the rhythm of the Bible, the stories in it. But to ask yourself this question, what does this playlist motivate you towards? You know, you listen to your indie folk playlist on a summer day when you're outside drinking lemonade on the porch. You listen to your uh, 80s dance remix when it's Saturday night and you're going to go out and party with your friends. You listen to the depressing crooning ballads when you're fighting with a loved one. So what about the genres of the Bible? What are they moving you towards? What are they emotionally pushing you towards? What are you emotionally connecting with? from these texts. Because that's what the Rabbonim, the rabbis, were trying to do when they connected these two chapters of the Bible to our Jewish New Year. They looked at the themes and they connected them to the particular holiday. They felt a rhythm. They felt an energy. They could feel that playlist as it resonated within the holiday. And it moved them towards something. So the question I would ask you is, where is the Bible moving you? Where is the Torah moving you? Where is Judaism, where is God moving you? Now here's the best part. Wherever you're moving towards, 
There is a place here for you at One Shoal. There will always be a place here for you at One Shoal. I know so many people who go to brick-and-mortar synagogues, and they do it for a year, they do it for two years, they do it for three years, sometimes 20 years, and then they leave. They leave. There was actually an article I read several months ago by a woman who said it ended up actually being easy for her to quit her synagogue. It was sad. It was really sad. The energy and the movement and the rhythm of Judaism in her life could not be contained in that brick-and-mortar place. But here at One Shoal, there's plenty of room for everybody. Whatever dance you're doing with Judaism right now, not only is there room on the dance floor, but there may be dance partners for you. And we may all be dancing in different rhythms and different times, listening to the different music of the human spirit. But we're nonetheless sharing the dance floor. We have that available to all of us as these remixes and mixes and new pieces come out at us all the time. There is always a place for you here. But you have to own it. You have to take it. You can't just show up. You have to own it. You have to get on the dance floor and you have to shake it or swing it or whatever it is that you're doing. That's so crucial. Do not be a bystander at one shoal. Do not sit in the back of the classroom. Get involved. Chat with us. Volunteer. Lead a class. Whatever song you're dancing to in life, we want to dance with you. It may not even be something that we like, but we want to dance with you. We want to do the dance of life with you. Because you matter. Because you are crucial. Because you are important. And I hope that in this new year, you'll think about that. And you'll get involved with us. And enjoy being here. And enjoy wherever life takes you and to know that you'll always have a place here at One Shoal with us. So with that, I wish you all Lashana Tova. Again, you can always email me, Adi, uh, Arava. Um, we're, you know, there's looks like those are a few volunteers that we have here. Um, you know, please get involved. Join us. There's no fees. Just by being here, you have already gotten involved. You know, Arva, Rachel, Adi, myself, Tracy, um, you know, Rebecca, you know, we've all gotten involved here at One Shul. You know, it's either minimal investment or maximum investment. It's whatever, you know, you want to, whatever you want to put in. But even a little bit helps, whether it's a little bit of time, a little bit of financial resources, a little bit of yourself. We, we need you. You matter. So please contact us. Connect with all of us. You can send me an email, patrick at punctora.org. Um, and I look forward to seeing you for Yom Kippur services that we've got coming up. So on the 12th, Thursday the 12th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Yom Kippur class with Adi. Then Friday, 1 p.m., we have an early Erev Yom Kippur service, which I'm going to be doing. It's early for me because it's uh, 1 o'clock. Um, but then we also have another Yom Kippur class with Rivka at 3, and then a Yom Kippur service Um at 7, uh, so this is sort of the Neila, it's the Yizkor breakfast um, service. That's going to be Saturday the 14th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then we get back into our regular cycle. We're going to have Shabbat services. We're going to start having Saturday morning services, which will be really cool. Um, I'm trying to do some early services because I know people appreciate that. Um, and, and we need you to lead. We need you to teach. We need you to be a chat room moderator. So I look forward to being involved with that. But most of all, know that you matter. Thanks.